get, you know, I wasn't sure whether I should do this uh, PowerPoint and, and show you the slides, but I think I will just because very few people have images in their heads about, you know, sugar plantations anyway. And so I'll go through them very carefully, uh, very quickly, not very carefully, um, <clears throat> and um, and then tell and then give you a sense of um, other lyrics. As Alison um, Arakawa said, uh, these songs are are four lines. Those of you who know Japanese poetry, haiku or tanka, know that the lines are all in seven syllables or five sil syllables. So haiku is like five seven five. Tanka is seven seven five seven five. These songs were seven 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 five syllables. So the construct <coughs> forced um, the composers to to work within, I guess, like in science or something. You know, you have a you have a construct that you you are are able to be um, flexible and creative uh, within the construct, but you have to stay within the construct. Some people, you know, <coughs> move outside uh, that, but it's very rare. Uh, <coughs> in, in any case, um, so let me let me show you some of the. So this is 1893, as I said, the uh, Japanese immigrants begin arriving. Uh, <coughs> there's one group that comes in 1868. But beginning in, in the mid '80s, uh, they begin arriving in, in some numbers. Um, this is a photograph of uh, Mr. Urata on, on the on the left, and this is Asakura, whom you saw in the in the film, and her husband. And this is on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, and there's a really good-looking guy on the right hand side, <laughs> but I don't know who that is, so we have to just leave <laughs> leave it as it is. So, so the work on the plantations was very varied. Plantations required um, large amounts of land. Uh, as you know, the, the, the plantations are mono, monocultural. They tend to dominate the society around them. So it's tea, coffee, cotton, rubber, uh, sugar. Uh, and, you know, I, look, a lot of people don't realize the Atlantic slave trade um, brought perhaps over 90% of the African slaves to Latin America and the Caribbean. Maybe 3-4% of um, Africans <coughs> came, uh, went to, the, to North America to work on cotton. The huge, almost everybody worked on, on, on sugar. <coughs> so, uh, cutting cane um, was one of the jobs they had. Uh, they had to have land, they had to have water, they had to have a market, which is why Hawaii is now part of the 50th state in the, in the United States. The, um, the necessity to create a, um, a duty-free entry into the American market is what created, first of all, the, the Reciprocity Treaty in 1878-1876, which, which provided access to Pearl Harbor for the American military, also allowed um, Hawaiian sugar to enter the market duty free, so um, eventually, when that when that relationship is threatened, um, the the businessmen uh, overthrow the queen in 1893, and eventually Hawaii becomes annexed and becomes part of the union. So that's that's um, the, the power of sugar. Um, so the only the only all those factors are beyond the control of the oligarchs of the plantation owners, land, water, markets. It's very hard for them to control. The only place they can control in order to make a profit is labor. And, and so they work very hard to find exploitable labor sources. They go to the Native Hawaiians first, the Chinese later, the Japanese eventually. Uh, they encounter resistance, of course, among, among all of these uh, different groups. Um, but the songs are, are especially valuable, I think, in, giving us um, a, a, a bird's eye view or a worm's eye view of um, how, uh, how people actually deal with resistance, how they think about um, what their conditions are like, and how they um, aspire to overcome these, short of um, working as a class. So you don't see in the, in, the, in the songs class consciousness. You see uh, all kinds of other things, however, and I'll try to get to those. So um, it, it, there's all kinds of ways. Sugar has this property of um, 
needing to be crushed uh, very quickly after being cut. Otherwise, a lot of the moisture is lost from the stalks, and so a lot of the sugar content is lost. Um, <clears throat> I told you earlier that that um, the hapai, the, the um, hole hole bushi was considered one of the easier jobs on, on the plantations. However, men did that job. Uh, so women didn't, weren't the only ones who did hole hole bushi work. Uh, and women uh, and men didn't do, weren't the only ones who did the major labor jobs like cutting cane or hapaiko. These bundles were often 50 to 80 pounds. So you can imagine carrying these bundles up a, a, a ramp to un unload them on a railroad car or on a, on a, on a truck. Um, the, the other, uh, by the way, that photo I think was from the island of Kauai. And I remember reading that in the 1920s there was a contest. Worker, workers, whatever their work, always find a way to feel some pride in what they do, even jobs that are really uh, terrible. So, um, and, and so like rodeos, uh, cowboys have contests to show, to demonstrate who's best at, at their work. So, so on Kauai, there was a contest to see who could load the most cane in a matter of an hour or two hours, whatever the time load was. So they stacked um, different um, uh, bundles of cane or loads of cane on, 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 the, uh, on the earth and uh, assign different people to um, uh, load the cane on a, on a cart. And <clears throat> in that contest, a woman won that contest um, against um, men as well. So one of the other jobs was um, uh, cutting weeds. The, the normal growing uh, season for cane in South America and the Caribbean was about a year. In Hawaii, which many, many people don't realize, <clears throat> that Hawaii is not as sunny as in, in other parts of the world. And so it took 18 months to two years for uh, the cane to grow to maturity. Um, in that period, uh, cut, cutting weeds, uh, hoeing weeds was a very important part of the job. So, so the field outfits that, that um, Allison wore um, singing, singing the Holy Holy Bushi um, clothed the entire body because they had to be protected from centipedes, scorpions, yellow jackets, um, and so on, which made their nests in the cane fields, and also from the dust and the heat and uh, uh, needles, the very tiny needles, which were really terrible that got under um, the clothing of, of people who worked there. So here's the uh, photograph of the Luna, the Portuguese overseers that I mentioned earlier, who were inserted into the plantation workforce and the whips which they occasionally uh, used or threatened to use on, on the workers. <clears throat> and here are a couple of photographs of women who came as picture brides um, and, and women who were um, geisha, including um, second generation women who were born uh, in Hawaii who became professional geisha and, and many of the children who were born as a result. I wanted to show this washing clothes by hand. Uh, There's Mr. Urata again growing up on, on the left um, and in the middle um, uh, with Alison Arakawa uh, to his right. And Urata, who was born in 1917, I'm sorry, yes, 1917, he was sent to um, Kumamoto in, in Japan um, when he was a few years old because his, his dad had died and his mom uh, couldn't take care of all of the kids, so he was sent to Kumamoto. And this picture is of him in Seoul, Korea, sometime in the 30s, um, because Korea had become a colony, had been colonized by, by um, Japan. And so he returned in, in, in the 30s, and um, in 1937, when his mom said, listen, there's a war going on, Japan has invaded uh, North China, um, uh, in no time at all, every male is, she was very prescient about this. She's a, she, had a, she was running a restaurant in Honolulu and said, you've got to come home because otherwise the, the Japanese military will conscript you. 
And so he came home much against his own will. He had been admitted to Waseda University, one of the premier private universities in Japan. And, 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 but his mom was adamant. Uh, so when he came home, um, after a few years, he said, oh, well, if I'm going to stay here, I have to learn English. Because he thought it was Japanese. He spoke no English. Uh, so he went to Mid-Pacific Institute, one of the few institutions which was hospitable to Japanese immigrant um, um, uh, students. So he was there, and he says that in 1943, as he was graduating in the spring and had been admitted to the University of Hawaii, Manoa, uh, his principal came to his classroom, and he, he, he swears his classroom was uh, studying American democracy. <laughs> and, and the principal pulled him out of class, took him to the, his office, two FBI agents um, uh, handcuffed him, wouldn't allow him to go back to his dorm room to pick up his toiletries, took him off to um, the immigration station, and then eventually to, to Honouli Uli uh, internment uh, camp, where he met a, a, um, a Japanese uh, journalist who had covered uh, plantation history and um, told him, Urata, one day they're going to let us out of here. And so when they do, uh, you have to go collect these songs because they're very important and nobody knows about them and they're going to die with the Issei, the immigrants. And so everybody thought this was true, that, that the songs would, would die with the immigrants. And I, I did too in the 80s, and so did Mr. Urata. But through a really weird um, um, a series of events, including the fact that he became a music teacher, and he trained all of his students to sing Holy Holy Gushi, including Alison Arakawa, whom you, whom you saw, who is, by the way, Arakawa is an Okinawan. Um, her father was of Okinawan descent. Her mom is, uh, uh, was Taiwanese. So, so she, she was a student of his for uh, like 19 years. And in 1999, <clears throat> uh, NHK, the powerhouse uh, uh, television producing studio in, in Tokyo, held a uh, singing contest in Honolulu. And so Mr. Urata said, okay, Alison, you have to um, sing. You have to enter this contest. And you're going to sing Holy Holy Bushi. And she said, oh my god, no. <laughs> the, the people who normally enter uh, singing contests in Japan are women who are elegantly clothed in the best kimono, and they sing enka, these, these um, ballads, usually love songs. Um, and so they're very elegant. And she says, you're going to put me in these peasant costumes and make me sing these peasant songs? Um, I'm going to make a fool of myself. He says, you have to do that. So he's very persistent. He was a very persistent guy. So she entered. and and. To everybody's surprise, she won the grand prize. And two years later, NHK did a series called Sakura, a morning series uh, in which a Yonsei Japanese American woman was uh, featured, and whose, husband, whose father uh, went to her class in, in Tokyo to talk about um, Japanese immigrants and the song. So now we, we know um, uh, this legacy is pretty much preserved, except um, that, that I, I do want to um, tell you about a few songs while I have time and, and give you some of the lyrics that um, really interested me. So, um, and, and give a new twist to the, the kinds of histories that have been uh, provided in, on the record. So we know, um, for example, that uh, people thought about home as soon as they left. As soon as they were leaving, as soon as they thought they were leaving, in fact. Um, so the ones who came, uh, you, well, you heard one of the songs. I won't give you the Japanese. Uh, I left home with a smile on my face, but today I still cut cane, a living hell. Um, or I left Japan with tears in my eyes. Now I'm here in Hawaii, stuck in the sugar cane. These are the kinds of songs that uh, Ron Takaki and Gary Okihiro have used as epigraphs to indicate uh, 
the oppressive conditions under which um, people work. But they weren't the only kinds of songs. So for example, I told you about the Luna, the overseers there. So one, one of the songs went, if only I could board up the Luna's eyeballs just to relax and sleep in for once. It sounds like Berkeley students. <laughs> Especially graduate students. Anyway, <clears throat> there's um, another one that goes, go ahead, go ahead. The Luna barks at us to work faster. I thrash the bastard in my dreams. Actually, there are, there are oral histories that say, indicate that they actually did um, physically beat the Lunas on, on occasion because they paid the price, you know, because the whole judicial system was um, geared to protect the uh, plantations. But I want to tell you, the, the, the African American experiences a lot of call and response songs. The, these don't exist in the Holy Holy Bushy, except in one case. And here's one where you know the speed up process in, in the Industrial Revolution, where um, in a factory system, uh, before um, <clears throat> autom automation, uh, the factory owners would pay certain people uh, more money, younger, faster workers, to do speed up, to, do, to keep, to set an uh, uh, artificial pace for other people to uh, follow. It doesn't exist anymore because of um, we, we drive people to distraction and hurt them and then fire them anyway. <laughs> so um, these guys were called hippani men. And so in, in, a, in, the, in the work, like hole hole work or hoeing uh, weeds, you, where, where uh, people's progress could be charted, where you could see quickly um, who was working faster, by who was ahead. So in, in those situations, um, <clears throat> you could, you, the plantations hired and paid younger, stronger guys a little bit more money every day so they could set an artificial pace. And so these songs are sort of interesting because here's one that, that, that comes from one of these hippani men. The man is English. Uh, hippani is from a Japanese term, uh, hipparu, to pull along or drag, to drag along behind you. <clears throat> um, keep up with me, the Sipari man is saying. Keep up with me and stop complaining. You can't do holy holy work with your mouth. And then, um, of course, the people behind are totally pissed, right? I mean, I mean why should they? Um, so they throw stones at the guy in front, and they, they do, they have, um, they, they catch up with him in, in the camp, uh, do whatever. So it must have been worth the extra money to these guys because they put up with a lot of nonsense from their, their friends or not, not so friendly friends. <clears throat> so the people behind would sing, why should I work so fast and follow your lead? You get the extra cash, not me. Mm. And then the people on the on, uh, uh, side might sing, they get 10 cents more each day to set an ungodly pace. Feed them to the dogs and let them die. <laughs> so it's really, so I, I, I promised, um, we don't have much time, so I, I promised I would tell you about the women. So, in, in, in the, in the I have to, but I have to set this up. So the Japanese government by the 1880s knows full well about the Chinese workers on the West Coast and the terrible sexual imbalance of ratios. 18, 20, 50 to 1, um, uh, the social dysfunctional um, issues like prostitution, opium, and gambling, which are most of us guys do anyway. So anyway, we don't need that excuse. Anyhow, so, so the Meiji government negotiates with the Hawaiian government um, uh, the inclusion of at least 20% women to try to um, provide against, to be proactive, to have, a, to have some kind of a stable community building thing, to avoid the excesses of the, the, what happened to the Chinese. <clears throat> well, uh, so most of the immigrants are between teen, the late teens and the 40s. This is um, 
when uh, young men and women are hyperactive um, sexually. Um, I sort of remember that. So, so anyway, so anyway um, but so 20% women, one out of five. That means that generally one, one couple was married. And then there are three other really horny guys who are, who are along on the, on the way. So the women, if they're not happy with their, 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 their um, spouses, sometimes, and sometimes they're arranged, um, have alternatives uh, immediately. And they took advantage of that. And the songs um, reflect this. So one of them goes, tomorrow is Sunday. Come visit me then. My husband will be watering the cane. I'll be home alone. Um, so, so we know that's a wukui, right? So there's another one that goes, if I fight with my husband, I can be with you. So let's start this brawl. The sooner the better. Um, or, uh, so I guess those are like PG. There's a, there, there's some that are more R-rated. I think everybody's of age here. <laughs> so, um, uh, by 1900, we know, because Honolulu kept health records, we know that most of the prostitutes in, in Hawaii were Japanese. Some of their clients were Chinese, because they, they had this sexual imbalance, right? <clears throat> So one of the songs um, <clears throat> goes, why settle for 35 cents a day doing holy holy work when I can make, when I can sleep with a Chinaman and make a dollar? Um, so a Chinaman is a translation I use for pake, some of you may know the term, which my Chinese friends in Hawaii sometimes say is not a pejorative term. I think it's not a good term because it's almost always associated with being stingy. And in Hawaii, our core value is being generous with your cohorts, so um, I'm not, it's, not, it's not a good term. So there's, there must be a male um, counterpart to this, and, and there is one that I found. Night after night, I watch her passion shrivel. Which bastard is slipping into her now? <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so, there are some others that are X-rated, which survive. And it's so fascinating to me that, that, in fact, the men sing the women's songs as well. Today, I mean, the, I mean when Mr. Urata was going around with this tape recorder, the, the men would be singing the songs about, the, about anyway, I won't, I won't tell you, you have to read the book about the R-rated <laughs> ones. Uh, but they are really, they're really raunchy. <laughs> um, so I think, as a, you, you know, it's, it's like, because there are a couple hundred of these, they, they talk about nostalgia, they talk about, oh, having lived through this, and have now, when I left Yokohama, I had tears in my eyes. But now I have children and grandchildren, too. So there are songs that express uh, you know, gratitude for be, having survived the whole ordeal and and and, um, and and having made it. But there are others where they're, they're um, expressing uh, sadness, going to Obon Bon festivals, the, the festivals of the dead, in in late summer, early fall, and going off to the forest and seeing um, um, headstones, graves that are unmarked. That, and, and lamenting the passing of colleagues who never made it. And, and so there's a wide variety of, of these. Oh, I have to tell you, I have to end with this. There's, there's some that are really funny, that, that um, are ironic. So by the 1970s, and we know this is a later song, um, there's one song that goes something like, um, my daughter, uh, she thinks she's so pretty. Um, she's so vain. You know, when is she going to become Miss Hawaii, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really a wonderful children's program. It was really fun working on this. Anyway, we, I think we've run out of time. We, we have yeah. questions and answers. Yeah, sure.
inflections or variations to the songs because of the different origins, regional origins? Um, sometimes, uh, but not very many. And, and sometimes they're in the dialect that, that we can tell. But generally, the ones that have remained, uh, that Mr. Urata caught, are, are sung in pretty much standard Japanese. Uh, and we know, uh, we don't have any that come from Okinawans. No, they have their own um, culture, um, but but um, we don't. And I don't, I don't know of any Filipino songs coming from the plantations. We have the Rondala, uh, the Filipino community songs, um, but we don't have any folk songs that come from the plantation work. So far as I know, the Japanese ones are the only ones, and no Chinese uh, songs either. On, on the on, you mentioned the role of the Portuguese and so on, uh, and you gave a couple of examples of songs that acknowledge their particular role in, mm -hmm. in this respect. But would you say I I, I don't know how Mr. Urata did the sample of, of the songs, but would you say there's a large corpus of songs of that sort, or most of them are nostalgic, thinking about home and this sort of thing, or perhaps. <coughs> about relationships and not so much about their treatment in the fields and so on. Is there a way you can generalize it? Well, you know, I actually did a breakout of that mm -hmm. and I can't recall offhand. Uh -huh. But a large number are work, mm -hmm. a large number are social life, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, social relations, uh, men and women, for, mm -hmm. um, um, among other things. And a, a large number are memory, mm -hmm. um, uh, thinking back. And so some of the songs that we know come from the post-war period, post-World War II period, which don't go back to uh, the plantation period. Um, there are quite a number of those, so maybe a third or so of those are songs like that. Um, but people, but they're reminiscing and thinking, reflecting on their lives um, from very early on. Mm -hmm. um, for example, there's one that, that that goes something like um, the, those flumes are carrying the uh, sugar cane to the mills where they're going to be crushed. So we, we see the uh, water carrying the sugar cane down to the mills. Um, where, is, where is my life, where is destiny taking me? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and, or um, walking on the beach, I, 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 I hear the uh, birds singing a plaintive cry, plovers or you know, or uh, seagulls maybe, um, and 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 how how poignant the cry is. Um, oh wind, you know, take that to my mother at home. Is really sort of, I, I think, really poignant. Do you talk about the songs like like uh, you know existing over this long period of time from the turn of the century to the post-war period? You said how the original melodies were from Japan. Are there the same melodies that are being like all these different songs that you're talking about? Are there are there are they the same like the same set of melodies in which the lyrics are being changed over time? So I guess like what I'm saying is like if you're talking about a song from the post-war period, is it possible that that song has one kind of rendition in let's say 1945, and the same melody has a different kind of like set of lyrics in Hawaii in 1930s, and then one in the 1910s? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the, mel the melody stays basically the same in Hawaii, mm. um, and, and uh, the lyrics change. So there's a set, like how many melodies are there for these songs? Are there? Oh, um, lots. And, and like all folk songs, they're sung differently by different practitioners, mm. as in Appalachia. Mm. So um, what Mr. Urata did was to collect them standardize them, use the, the, the parts in, in, in a way, the, the way that uh, Joan Baez and the uh, Kingston Trio and Harry Belafonte, you know, uh, did in the 60s to create songs that were more melodious and um, 
attractive to the to those of us who were listening to them <laughs> back in that period. Um, so he did basically the same thing. He um, in the early '90s, I think he he actually did a score which didn't exist for for the folks for the folk singers. They did this all orally, uh, orally, um, and and copyrighted it with the Library of Congress. So he actually scientifically mapped this out, and that's the version he taught to people like Allison Arakawa. And so she, her singing um, kept, the, kept it alive. But I will tell you, I, when, when I, um, I did this talk at the um, JCCC NC, um, Japanese Culture Center in, in J-Town, um, one of my former students was Wesley. Who's a Berkeley PhD? He teaches at State now, but he does a lot of music. And he, when he heard I was going to do this, he asked his friends to see if they could get a group together to actually perform. And um, so um, he had some some of the friends uh, were able to score this, and and so they got together a small group to actually an ensemble to do this. So we now have people in San Francisco who are singing Ole Ole Bush <laughs> and making up their own uh, versions of it. So it's, it, it, to me, it's a wonder that, that, that it's alive. Yeah. A um, couple of questions. One, um, it seems like it, you know, the, the singing of it, tick, it changed over time in terms yeah. of the context, right? I mean, it was earlier folk songs that were sang in the field, but now it's much more um, done on a performative level, yeah. you know, collective community right. kind of level, right? Yes. Um, uh, you know, it's, so it's less, in, less informally sort of scripted, it seems, or is that, is that right? Um, right. That's, right. I wanted to kind of track the, the changes yeah. of context. It is really performative now. Okay. It, it is only, I think, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't know whether people will would sing that way. Mm -hmm. This originates in the fields. It um, moves to uh, tea houses where, where the men, for the most part, are with the geisha, are drinking and singing. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a, there are two uh, actually uh, different genres of uh, uh, songs that, are, that, are, that really are called plantation style and tea house style. Um, and now, uh, it's a, re it's a, a different genre on, entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and just a second question on, th these are really oral sort of yeah. traditions, right? right? Do you see it as diverging from a written version of their histories, their experiences? Is there sort of an equivalent, um, you know, on the written level? Um, or is it really just sort of registering different sensibilities, you know, of their lives? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's that's for meta historians to take a look at. I I I, I do know. I, I do feel that 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 um, this provides us with a different kind of way. Number one, it, it we actually can um, find voices for people who are nameless and faceless. On a planta you know, we think of numbers with plantation workers, you know, who um, who 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 don't have features and who don't, who don't have um, individual kind of attributes. But if you if you read or see the, the uh, songs that deal with you know hating lunas or um, waiting for a lover, I mean, it really makes a difference. I, I think so. You know, it is. A, I think that it's an entirely different um, take on these lives than the histories that I've seen of these of these people. And one one of the interesting things about that Kataria, I, I think, is to is is kind of like a a morality tale, a warning story about immigrants today, to 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 sort of think about what is worth keeping. Uh, uh, in terms of what's going on, that you may not necessarily think is worthwhile, and the society doesn't think is worthwhile, because it says because it says 
historians say the written word is really paramount, right? And so maybe there's some things that are going on in the Cambodian community. Yeah. I think that's sort of the kind of conversation we've had you know, for a while now with regards to these smaller communities, and there are some things that need to be preserved, but at the same time, um, funders don't always see the importance, and so it just sort of, we're in this yeah, kind of chicken yeah. and egg thing. Um, can I follow up with one question, uh, with regards to the circulation of, of um, ideas, ideologies, whatever. I know that in the Okinawan uh, community, I, I know that some um, art forms have basically recirculated back to Okinawa mm -hmm. and created uh, oh, sort of yes. a spark for revitalization of some of the arts that have sort of were at risk of, of being lost, whether it's a dragon dance mm -hmm. or whatnot. And I was wondering if uh, I noticed that there are some of the performances were yeah. in Tokyo. Uh, right. So it has, and then, you know, there's a sort of a flow back yeah. to Japan, and I wonder if there is, is it a seamless reintegration back to the traditional tradition, traditional tradition, to sort yeah. of the traditional form, or is it a totally a different? Uh, um, a newly evolved you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to know. To, I, I do know that that particular group is uh, that you saw on stage uh, included one guy who's a very um, prominent Okinawan uh, folk singer, uh, playing the uh, Okinawan sashi. Um, but that group um, is a sort of left radical group, Soul Flower Union, which has performed um, internationally. But a lot of Every, every time I turn around, there's more people who have, have begun to do this, in, in Japan as well. So, I don't know. I, I can't imagine that it will become a big deal, but, but it looks like a sort of an interesting thing. Uh, yeah. Along this line of uh, questions about circulation, do you, do you know if any of the, these songs, I can't think of the right term to ask, migrated from Hawaii to the mainland at all? Well. Uh, only in the sense that Alison, our, our call, lives in LA. Oh. And she's performed this at JANA, at the Japanese American National Museum. And as I say, the Wesley's group have, you know, has taken it on here. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was also thinking, though, about within the historical context ah. of the time in which you're talking about. Yeah, there was a secondary migration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, I don't think so. It didn't seem like it. Yeah, yeah I don't think so. And I think the J community, um, on the West Coast was more, much more fragmented, even though you had little Tokyos and, and all. I don't, I don't think the same kind of minimum sort of cohort that was necessary to really cut, carry on this kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. that, that's my sense. Um, poetry groups, hundreds of them. Um, one, one of my colleagues, a Japanese scholar in Japan, has amassed like 20,000 tanka, you know, verses mm -hmm. uh, from ar across the country. So there are a lot of uh, poetry. But this, this requires, I think, a group, and a group to um, appreciate mm -hmm. and, and carry on. We should, how are we doing on time? Um, we're okay. We have Can I have one more question? Sure, sure of please. course, absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> By the late 20s, in places like LA, San Antonio, there were um, uh, Spanish language broadcasts, usually very early in the morning, mm. in which folk songs uh, were sung in Spanish, mainly by Mexican immigrants. Mm. To the extent that you know, in the case of Hawaii, uh, was this ever, did, did Japanese radio programs, whether it's early in the morning, late at night, uh, ever uh, have this kind of music played, performed, and so on, as far as you know? You know, um, I don't know of any Japanese radio programs before the war. Oh, OK. I, I, I do know they began shortly after the war. And, they, and um, people called in um, beginning in the 50s. People would sometimes call in and sing. They, they may have those kinds of programs, but not. I don't think it was valued. You know, they may have, they may have sung other kinds of songs, but not not Holy Holy Bushi. What about during internment? Um, is there oh. a whole genre of songs that emerge? You know, yeah, yeah. You know? Not these though. Not these, but no. oh, okay, different set of yeah. um, folk songs. Yeah. Huh. 
I mean, and those tended to be, uh, folk, as far as I know, they tended to be um, folk songs from Japan mm -hmm. and traditional Japanese folk songs. Not, not so much folk songs with lyrics that have been created um, here. I may be wrong about that. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody's really looked into that. I know we have things like big bands, you know, the mm -hmm. say second generation guys mm -hmm. who um, formed like uh, Jimmy Dorsey type. Big bands and dance bands in, in the camps. Yeah. So they're, but they're performed over such a long period of time. How do you, how do you, is it possible to place them within a particular historical moment? So like if you're trying to analyze them within the, the scope of creating a history, right? Like, I mean, if you're doing an oral history, you can ask someone, well, when did this happen, right? But if you're, you just have these recordings from the 60s or 70s, how, how does one oh, use, that, use that as a source yeah. to, write, yeah. to, write a, to write history? Well, the, the songs that were recorded in the 60s and 70s include interviews with people oh, okay. who had yeah. sung them back in the day. So we know they were sung, we know they were sung at least in the 1890s because we have a publication from 1900 that includes these songs, a couple of these songs. So we know they were there by the 1890s. And we know they were there through the 20s and 30s. But like when you're, when you're trying to, so when you're trying to position, like position those specific song, you have to go to the interview to kind of figure it out. If it, or, or sometimes the context will right. tell you, right. like uh, 35 cents a day. Yeah, sure. We'll put it into a contract right. labor period, yeah, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. So once in a while.